a timely update on influenza and people living with HIV. Um, my disclosure, so I have, uh, I work with UT Southwestern and Houston on an independent research project, which is funded by Gilead Sciences. The funding is over, but just so you all know, this is an observational study. We're not using any uh, drugs for the study. Um, I am not gonna use, I will do my best to not use uh, trade or brand names throughout this talk, but I apologize if I fall short. Um, so we're gonna talk about, uh, first we're gonna do a little bit of just like influenza and demographics of influenza and what it, an FD of influenza and what it looks like. Uh, we're gonna talk about how people living with HIV are at higher risk, common symptoms, and then strategies to reduce risk. So uh, this is not a picture of COVID. I know it looks like COVID, but it's not. Uh, this is what influenza looks like, and it looks a lot like COVID. So the COVID, the influenza equivalent of the spike protein on COVID is, are these two things, neuraminidase and hemagglutinin, which are sort of stick off of the surface of the influenza virus. And then you get an antibody to this hemagglutinin, and that protects you against disease. And the way that strains are identified is by both of these things. So like with COVID, we talk about the spike protein and is it Omicron or is it Delta or is it all those things? With flu, it, they have two ways that we identify it. It's H and N. And so you'll see viruses being called H3N1, that's hemagglutin in class three, neuraminidase class one. Um, it's really not all that important. We'll just talk a little bit about how, uh, how the reassortment is important uh, right now. So influenza is another one of those viruses, just like HIV, that does not have proofreading activity. So with HIV, this induces immense amounts of diversity every time it makes a copy of itself. Um, influenza diversity is a little bit less, actually, than HIVs but you can see two different types of diversity, which is different from HIV. So the first is if you have an influenza virus and it makes a copy of itself and it doesn't proofread itself well, and so there is a new mutation, that's this little dot in the new virus. That's called antigenic drift. These changes happen sort of slowly, but a specific influenza virus, as it makes copies of itself, will change over time. The big change is when you have what's called antigenic shift, which is when two influenza viruses infect the same cell at the same time. And then all these different, so there are these sort of different segments of the genome get shuffled up together. It's kind of like if you were in the grocery store and someone else was in the grocery store and they bagged your groceries together and then you had to separate them out, you wind up with different, a very different virus that is reassorted at the end. This is called antigenic shift, and this is what leads to pandemics, where there are big changes, rapid changes in the influenza virus. And there have been many famous uh, influenza pandemics over time. Uh, if you all haven't read The Great Influenza by John Barry, that's an amazing history of the 1918 influenza pandemic, but there's lots of, lots of this out there. So how is it transmitted? It is a respiratory virus. So transmission is by aerosol droplets or direct content, contact. So I think one of the things to think about when we first talked about COVID, there was a lot of worry that we would get a lot of transmissions on, of COVID on surfaces. And the reason that we were worried about that was because of flu. Because for flu, you can get it if someone coughs near you uh, in a shared space, or if you touch something. So this guy classically is touching his phone. Our phones uh, carry a lot of viruses around, so you should regularly sanitize your phone. The other thing that is a problem with flu and flu spread is that it is really spread and driven by young children. So young children are the most likely to, to catch flu. They are also the most likely to spread infection. This is also different from COVID. And when influenza A is introduced into a family, up to 60% of exposed persons eventually get infected and half get the clinical symptoms. So it is really, it spreads a lot in families. 
What's the syndrome look like? So it looks like a flu-like syndrome and there's a reason that we call it that. So you usually have a fever, you feel chills, fatigue, myalgias, headache, runny nose and nasal congestion are very common, sore throat, somewhat common, non-productive cough. And then if you are getting pretty sick, shortness of breath. And this is the CDC, is it a cold or a flu um, table? And you can see why people get confused about this because it is very, there's a lot of overlap. So like symptom onset with a cold is gradual, flu is abrupt. I don't, I don't pay enough attention to my symptoms to really know what's a, a, abrupt. Um, chills, I think the real difference is how sick people feel with flu, like chills and weakness and the body aches are really uh, flu-like. And what we all worry about, so these are the symptoms of flu, but we all worry about the things that are in the right-hand column as complications. So um, meningitis and encephalitis, Ray's syndrome is more common in children as are uh, seizures from fever. Um, Guillain-Barre happens after flu. We've seen a lot of complications of cardiac complications. So pericarditis and myocarditis, these are things that we now know are also post-COVID syndromes, but uh, cardiac after flu as well. Lots of superimposed infections. So you get flu, it damages your lungs, it reduces your ability to clear other infections, and then you get a bacterial pneumonia after that. Lots of very dreaded pregnancy-induced complications. So the H1N1 uh, epidemic of 2009 was pretty famous for this. A lot of really, uh, a lot of pregnant women got very, very sick with that one. And then you can get myositis and rept from flu. So people with HIV are at increased risk of serious influenza-related complication, and this is unsurprisingly related to how ill people are with their HIV disease. So if your CD4 is low or if you're not on antiretroviral therapy, you are more likely to become more severely ill with flu. Um, heart and lung complications are mo more common among people living with HIV, and they can have prolonged flu symptoms. They can actually shed the virus for longer as well. We've seen this as well in COVID where people with compromised immune systems, their bodies cannot suppress the virus and so they keep shedding. That occurs with flu as well. And then there are other things that co-occur oftentimes in our patients or in the populations we serve that lead to serious complications. So if you have asthma, heart disease, or diabetes, which are all very common among people living with HIV, particularly in South Texas, you are also at risk for higher, uh, higher you are also at higher risk for complications. All right, so who should you be testing? So people with an acute respiratory illness symptoms with or without a fever should probably be tested for flu in 2022, 2023. I'll show you all the the curve right now of where we are with flu. Um, I would say right now in San Antonio, you probably still should test people for flu, even though we're sort of at the end of our epidemic. Uh, you can, yes, have both flu and COVID. This led to the really unfortunate term fluvid, which is like many people, including my daughter's entire seventh grade classroom, thought there was some new virus. It was a combination of flu and COVID. It is not a new virus. It just means you can get infected with both at the same time. Um, there are a lot of different ways to test for flu, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those testing. But you can get and in fact, we are doing this here at university, you can get tested for flu and COVID at the same time, uh, should you wish. For flu, there's, there's antigen testing, that's rapid, uh, and you can, you can also do DFA scanning. The, these tests are less sensitive and less specific. So it's very similar to antigen testing for COVID. It's good if you have symptoms, it'll give you an answer relatively quickly, but do not bet the bank on those tests. The better tests are nucleic acid detection or molecular assays. Some people call these PCRs, but they're not actually, some of them are PCRs and some of them are not. Um, there are rapid ones that can get you results back in 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how quickly your lab is running them. And then there's single plex PCR, which is just, just testing for flu, but there's also a multiplex PCR and you can run a series, you can test for rhinovirus and, and adenovirus and flu and COVID if you wish. These have higher sensitivity and specificity and are really the test of choice. I pulled down this surveillance report uh, last week 
to show you sort of where we are with uh, flu right now. And you will see that unfortunately we are still sort of in the red here in Bear County. So I would say if you have people with flu and you're in South Texas or you're in Houston, um, you should probably test them for flu. Um, and this is what our flu season looks like so far. So remember I said that there were different ways to identify the flu by the H antigen and the N antigen. So this shows you that the majority of our epidemic so far this flu season, this winter flu season has been an H3 based epidemic. We've got a little bit of H1N1, that is the 2009 pandemic strain still hanging around. And then a lot of subtype not performed. We see, we're seeing mostly flu A this year, which is not uncommon. And you can see that we're on the decline. So this is actually unusual for us, uh, particularly in Texas. We are used to seeing a later flu season. So this is, um, for those of y'all who are not used to reading things by MMWR week, um, this is week 50, 51, 52. So this is, this is 2022, and these are the first five, four and a half weeks of 2023. So this is January, basically. First week in January, second week in January, third week in January, fourth week in January, all here. Um, this is just a reminder that testing is really the tip of the iceberg with flu. So um, we do not test. There are many, many, many um, people with flu who do not get tested uh, because they think they have a cold or they know they have the flu, but they just don't bother to be tested because what are you going to do about it? They don't have uh, either access to care or they don't have um, medical comorbidities that would lead them to seek treatment. Um, so this is sort of our last year's flu. Uh, this is where we are. Now, some of you all may remember that we, our 2021 flu epidemic was really unusual because we did not have as much flu uh, in 2020 to 2021 flu season. And that was probably because many people were masking, many people were working at home at that time. We had a lot less flu. But this is just a reminder that uh, there are between nine to 41 million illnesses every year many hospitalizations, and actually many deaths. So how do we prevent those deaths? And how do we prevent the hospitalizations? And how do we pre prevent severe disease? So early initiation of antiviral treatment, if you have symptoms, is really important and really does work. So neuraminidase inhibitors, uh, they bond to that N antigen and keep the virus from leaving the cell. Um, you can take them just for five days, longer if you're hospitalized. And these are oseltamivir and there's actually inhaled zanamivir. There is also IV paramivir, which you can give once. And this is um, rarely used, I will say. Most people wind up getting oseltamivir uh, because also if you have asthma in the flu, uh, inhaled zanamivir is associated with bronchospasm. So people generally don't want to try to use that. There is a new-ish medication around for the last three years, I believe, called polymerase, which is a polymerase acidic endonuclease inhibitor, which prevents replication. So this is more like, you know, uh, like a lot of HIV drugs and antiretroviral therapies. It's called baloxavir, and you just use it once. But relevant to us, this is not recommended for people with immunocompromised. So you really should prescribe treatment as soon as possible especially in those who have any progressive disease of any duration. So if you're healthy and you're not risk, um, if you've had flu for more than two days, you probably won't benefit from treatment and you can get rest, hydration, supportive care. If you, however, are immunocompromised, we treat at any point. Um, and it is really important, remember I said that flu sort of hurts your lungs ability to clear other pathogens, including bacteria or other germs and you can get another additional infection. So if somebody isn't getting better in three to four days, in particular, if they're getting worse, we really think hard about whether or not they have a new infection, a bacterial infection on top of their flu. All right, so vaccine recommendations. So the flu vaccine is recommended for everybody over six months 
who doesn't have a contraindication. We do not use flu vaccine enough. It works incredibly well. It's documented to work well across all sectors, but in particular in healthcare, healthcare environments where flu vaccine is mandated, like our own, um, have fewer deaths from flu amongst their clients. So we, in getting vaccinated, are not just protecting ourselves, protecting our family because it spreads a lot in families, but they are really, we are really protecting all of our patients and clients. So all of the flu vaccines this year are quadrivalent. They protect or are meant to protect against four different types of flu. You notice I mentioned that most of the flu this year so far that we've seen is this one, uh, the H3. Uh, and then the rest, almost all of the rest is the next one, the H1N1. Of all the viruses that have been analyzed since May of 2022 in the US by the CDC, most viruses are closely related to this vaccine component. So we're thinking that the flu vaccine is probably pretty effective this year. Now, pretty effective, it ranges between 15 to 60%. So it is really important to talk to people about that. For folks over 65, 65 or over, you should get a higher dose and an adjuvant dose. So if you can't get that, you can use standard dose, but if you go into CVS or many different places, they'll ask if you want the high dose vaccine and that the answer is definitely yes for people who are 65 or over. Um, I already talked about this. So if you get the vaccine, you have a reduced risk of illness, reduced need for provider visits. It is definitely not 100%. So it is really important to let people know that even though they get vaccinated, it doesn't mean that they are 100% protected against the flu. And then the, the sort of concern is, so this is a little bit hard to read, but if you look at the red dots and the purple dots, those are vaccines, flu vaccines given in the 2022, 2022 and 2023 flu season. You'll notice that this is definitely lower uh, and this is lower. So we are having fewer people get vaccinated for flu this year. There has been a lot of very successful anti-vax uh, misinformation surrounding COVID vaccines, which spreads into other vaccinations. So fewer people are getting flu shots this year, which is definitely of concern. Now, if you didn't get the vaccine, but you are at high risk for infection or complications of infection, there's another option, which is prophylaxis. So if you are at high risk for complications and have been exposed, so say my 81-year-old mom, sorry, mom, I'm disclosing your age, uh, my 81-year-old mom who has lung issues didn't get the flu vaccine this year, but she, but I have the flu and I come home and I expose her to the flu. She could actually go on chemoprophylaxis. So this is also relevant to our patients who are immunocompromised. If you have a CD4 under 200, this is probably recommended to you. So you can give people oseltamivir after exposure. So you take it daily during the potential exposure and for seven days after the last known exposure, you're supposed to start it within 48 hours of exposure. Dosing depends on your creatinine clearance, but this is effective in terms of preventing house, especially household transmission of flu from one family member to another family member who might be immunocompromised. And that is, a, there's a ton of resources for flu out there. I'm gonna post in the chat, actually the uh, Bear County flu report. Like if y'all wanna see those data, there's a bunch of data there. And these are my references. Thank you all very much for your attention.